Almost 50 years ago to the week, September 9, 1973 to be precise, Sir Jackie Stewart clinched his third world championship at the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. It was a titanic drive. He was running fourth in the early laps. He dropped back to 20th place when he got a puncture, but then regained that fourth place in the closing laps. Enough points then to clinch that world championship. I spoke to Sir Jackie about that on Tuesday and about why Monza has been so significant throughout his career. He had his first Grand Prix win at the Italian circuit. He won a slipstream of there against Jochen Rint in 69. And looking at those three dates, we also decided it was a good moment to look back at what had evolved in Jackie's life between those key moments. How he evolved as a driver, how he evolved as a safety crusader and how he changed almost single-handedly the professionalism and the business side of Formula One. So we began by talking about that 73 race, that drive back to fourth place. But of course, it took in a lot more. Probably is one of my best memories of uh, my career in the sense that it had a puncture, as you know, um, at the very early stages, I think at the second lap or something like that. Uh, punctures I had never had before. Um, and of course, it takes a, in those days, it took a considerable amount of time to change a wheel. Hmm. Um, so I was absolutely miles back from the rest of the field. Um, but I had a clear track. I remember that very, very clearly. Um, and then I passed the odd car up there. <laughs> and towards the end, I thought the funniest thing was that uh, Ken Tittle were all they were all on the wall, you know, because obviously I was going well, um, and he uh, he was sending the signs out, uh, you know, lap fifteen, Fangio, <laughs> 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 you know, because he was giving me who was ahead each time and who I was having to catch up. And the, the, the Fangio one came out of typical Tyrrell sense of humour. Um, because I really didn't know what was happening. I mean, I, in those days, there was no communication. You know, now they'd be on the horn, they'd be talking to each other, they would know what was happening. Um, so probably from a point of view of sheer driving, it was maybe one of the best drives I had because I, I was... I was on my own for most of the time, so therefore I could use the track the way I wanted it. I wasn't being um, bothered by not using the best lines and so forth because of other people or the turbulence in those days that we had um, b behind other cars. Um, so, so I was regularly doing the the lap record. And the nice thing about Monza in this respect is that that was an important race for me to win the world championship, uh, although it was fairly early to win it, uh, if you know what I mean. Um, but but you didn't feel you didn't feel great going into that race. I, I was just reading the notes um, before that race and, and you just had a cholera inoculation and you had a flu bug as well and you were coughing it wasn't you weren't in great physical shape but it just shows when the adrenaline goes how sir jackie stewart could could go beyond his own physical limits i think also that race didn't we run a a, a marathon not marathon but a, ra a race round the track you did well, it was frank williams that was fastest that's right james hunt came after that and I, I had already been to the doctor every day and so forth. And Ken was dubious about me doing the, the race, but I was feeling that we should do it. Um, and, and I did okay. I think it was fourth, wasn't I, in the, in, in the, in the race? Anyway, um, these are the kind of things we did in Formula One in those days. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's not what would happen today, that's for sure. Amazing times and a moment I think to reflect on your career and indeed how big a role Monza has played in your career obviously 73 you clinched the championship there it was also the scene of your first Grand Prix win in 1965 driving for BRM Graham Hill as your teammate can you remember that moment on the podium afterwards a, Mon a real Monza slipstreamer Graham and I were left because Jimmy 
something mechanical happened yeah. to him. But we were every lap we were changing. Of course, in those days, every lap we're changing twice on on the lap, minimum twice on the lap down the you know the the, the front straight, and then the back straight. And quite often we'd do it three times. We'd get three leads in the one lap. Um, so when Graham and I were left leading by quite a margin, uh, Tony Rudd was busy telling us to slow down. Don't pass each other. Slow. Down. You couldn't not pass because the draft was such in those days that you, you did you know pass each other and you'd pass each other twice in the lap it was just there was a clear way to keep going at, at the right speed uh, but then graham on the parabolica uh, with i think was it two laps to go he, he 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 made a mistake for no good reason i mean he was ahead of me going into the parabolica uh, but he was wide and got on the gravel a little bit. So I, I of course, I wasn't on the gravel. And I was quite away, you know. I, I, I then, of course, won the race, which uh, for me to win a Grand Prix in my first World Championship year was a a big deal, a very big deal. Yeah. But one of the nicest things. But in those days, we stayed at the Villa d'Este, which is one of the nicest hotels in the world, and Graham was there. Obviously, the, 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 the team were there, apart from the mechanics weren't there, but Tony Rudd and Louis Stanley and everybody were there. And uh, they asked me to come and see the mechanics the night of the win, which I did, which was meaning going back into Milan. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next morning, I wanted to get home fast. So I got the concierge to try and get me a you know, a, a, an airline reservation. And uh, I was coming down the stairs of the Villa d'Este and the concierge was telling this girl at whatever the airline it was, you've got to get Jackie Stewart in. He's the world champion. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the first time it had ever been a, a, an issue. of, And I thought, wow, that was it. I mean... <laughs> Um, no, no. I mean, it was a great moment for me to win it. And to win in my first season was a big deal because that more or less didn't happen in those days. Um, uh, so yeah. and I, well, I was third in the World Championship that year, I think. Indeed. Uh, was Jim Clark very happy for you that day to have won? Do you remember talking to Jimmy afterwards? We had had a good, uh, you know, such a good relationship. Um, from the very beginning, because when I was still driving for a Curia course uh, and and Barry Fowler, um, I would go down to Jim's place in the borders. Uh, I'd go down with Graham to to Jimmy's home and stay over and and so forth. And and when I was driving for a Curia course, it was for me terrific to be able to talk to Jimmy and talk about things. Um, uh, that was a, a very unusual privilege, I think, in in our lives, the two of us. We got such a unique relationship because, of course, John Whitmore had given us his apartment in the West End and a very good address in the West End uh, for the two of us to have use of his apartment. So Jimmy and I would be, you know, there and he was... Uh, nobody ever thought that Jimmy was a, a boy, a, a boy for the girls, but in fact, he very much was. <laughs> and more than one, and I would arrive at the door, and knock on the door to get in because he had locked it. And here was another bird we had never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Jackie, that that win, that win in, in '65 was the beginning of everything in many ways not only your career obviously going to stardom from there but also the many many changes that a you saw in formula one but beyond that the changes that you helped to implement in formula one and i'm talking about safety i'm talking about sponsorship business professionalism so many different things evolved 
effectively from 65, from the day you won that race, you had your accident at Spa, obviously, in 66, and that triggered in your mind safety developments. I think it's interesting, uh, I've never asked you this before, but it's interesting that at the time you drove for BRM and Louis Stanley, much maligned these days, but nonetheless at that time, from your point of view, very focused on safety and a good ally for you to move forward with safety in Formula One. Sure, and he uh, became the chairman of the GPDA. Uh, I was president of it and he was chairman. Um, and he helped us a great deal in that respect, you know, because of the medical unit that he created. We all did it together. But, I mean, he was working on it because that was his job. Um, and at that time, the medical equipment at Grand Prix, the, 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 the medical center was nothing at all. And there was never taught people. I always make... the. the remember the fact that, that there was always a medical headquarters but there was also one man that led it and the man that led it at Branch Hatch was a gynecologist <laughs> I mean not the kind of incidents accidents uh, or injuries that you would be uh, expecting to have somebody whether it was a neuro guy or a bone guy or anything else, but no he was a, a gynecologist because he was an enthusiast to the to the Branch Hatch people at that time. Oh, let's have Fred. You know, he's a doctor, but he wasn't specialised in a field that would have helped many people no. uh, in having accidents. I mean, that was where, you know, I started to see um, the need for something considerably more in the, in the safety field. Uh, because Graham and Joe Bonnier had been presidents of it before me. And it was then that when I became president of that, that I had the influence um, to drive everybody into, well, avoiding the Nürburgring, for example. That was a huge decision to make. And Spa, two of the greatest racetracks in the world. Uh, that everybody wanted to win and so forth. But um, Louis Stanley was part and parcel of that. And that unit that he, I have to say that although we all were involved in it, he, it was driven by him, uh, that unit. And, and I don't know if he ever really got as much um, credit for that as he should have. Uh, because, you know, all of us, every one of us, had our blood uh, connections to the fathers, the mothers, or to the husbands or the wives, rather. Um, you know, it was an amazing piece of kit, and it was very well done, and never got anything like the credit that it should have done. Yeah. Or did Lewis get Lewis Stanley didn't get as much because. We, we don't want to say this, but it was a rather pompous man, um, et cetera. And, and I never forget the fact that when he got his a, a title, it, it, it walked as glad he told him that it was Lord Stanley. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, if you yeah. think back to these days, um, the changes that were made, and the governance of the sport at that time were, was generally a group of enthusiasts who weren't, you know, onto the hardcore because we had gone from a 1500cc formula to three double it mm, yeah. to the and arrival speeds at a corner were so much higher. Mm. No runoff areas, no deformable structures, nothing. But Sir so Jackie, I think now looking back at that time, what strikes me is your ability to have raced in Formula One, Formula Two, sports cars, endurance, Can-Am, touring cars, and on top of all that, worry like crazy about safety and try to manage the drivers in the GPDA and try to get a central focus to where you were going. 
I can't imagine how you had had enough hours in the day and how you actually achieve that and how you how you run your life if you look at the the way the drivers today have to specialize just on driving when you look at what you were doing back then it is just it's almost beyond comprehension well it wasn't a comfortable one because i got a huge amount of aggravation from it and uh you know when i when i closed the nurburgring i mean i had i had health uh, strengths of, of uh, you know been killed. I had to have security. Germans were coming up to our, our house in Binya at that time, um, throwing stuff in and shouting and bawling because we had a lock on the, on the, on the gate, if you know what I mean. That was a driveway. Um, no, the threats, I, the life threats I got at that time were, were amazing. Um, but it was the right thing to do. And People like Graham recognized that and came with me. Um, Dan Gurney came with me and Jimmy came with me. And some of the drivers, I mean, one, a good friend of mine today is Jackie X. But at that time, he would not talk to me uh, because he thought I was spo spoiling motor racing. I was uh, damaging the, the integrity of the sport. But so many people were killed. I mean, um, uh, 57 of my friends were killed while I was driving racing cars. I mean, that's not people outside of my racing career. That's in my racing career. I did, I did more funerals, I think, than any man I've never met, ever met. Because it was the thing to do. Um, and if I were shouting and trying to change um, security, then it would have been wrong for me not to go to the funeral. For example, Francois never went to a funeral. He was frightened to go for a funeral. He thought it would it was a, a bad thing for him, um, and and he wasn't right or wrong. It was just his belief that oh, if I go to a funeral, then the next thing I'll do is be, be dead, because at that time that's what was happening. Yeah. You know, and, and, and uh, mm. you know better than me, but at that time, the race never stopped. I mean, when Piers was killed at, at Zandvoort, uh, you know, we drove through the, like we did again with Joe Sledger, Joe, Joe yeah, Joe Sledger Joe at, at Rome. But, you know, these were things that the modern group would never understand. You know, to to drive past a car in flames, and it must have been for every lap, it must have been about twenty to twenty-five laps. The thing was still on fire, but I knew that it was it was Pierce because his head had his helmet had come off, and I knew it was him. But it, it, he had to be dead, you know, and yet. You still rode, you still raced at the same speed. Jochen and I, Piers was one of our best friends. He came and stayed with me here, where we are now in Switzerland, and stayed quite often with Jochen. But, you know, that was the type of mm. life we led. led. I mean, Jimmy, we travelled together. Uh, Piers, we travelled together. Uh, you know, my teammates, we travelled together, we lived together. I mean... That camaraderie just doesn't exist today. Um, it was a, a, a very close collection of extraordinary people. And you, they were being killed regularly. Have you always slept well at night? More or less, yeah. It's I mean, it's contradictory. But... Uh, it never affected me, and even funerals seldom affected me. In, in those days, um, I can remember the only time I cried. What happened twice? The only time twice. Once was Jimmy, and it only happened because. 
I, I wasn't supposed to be allowed to come back to Britain because I had gone non-resident and I had to get permission from the prime minister to come back. And I flew in, I had, I, I had to fly in a Learjet from Switzerland in the morning to go back out the same day so that I wasn't in. That's what the government told me I had to do. And uh, an American who was going to be vice president of the United States of America, uh, Curtis LeMay, uh, had an association in Zurich. And he phoned me up and he said, are you going to Jimmy's funeral? And I said, well, it's complicated. He said, look, I've got a Learjet. You can come with me. And he flew in the Learjet down to Geneva for us to fly to Edinburgh uh, to get in. And this is, this, is, this is quite a good story for you, really, because when we got and did the funeral, um, it was all the local boys that was carrying Jimmy in. Normally, it would have been Graham and I or somebody like and other people who died at that time. But it was it was the family and very close friends. And when we went back to the to the house, to, to mom and dad's house, I mean, uh, Jimmy's mom and dad's house, the, the father and mother were there and they weren't in tears. And I will never forget because Dan, we all had to go past and respect to, to Jimmy, to the mum and dad. And Dan Gurney burst into tears. And the mum and dad had not been in tears at all. I mean, it was one of these very unusual things. And it meant that I fell into tears because of Dan. Uh, it only happened twice, once there and one the other time with Francois. But it was a, a a cult that just isn't recognized today. I mean, it's just not there. Mm. It was an amazing connection of people and relationships. And, you know, when Dan won at Monza, I think I was second, wasn't I? Not Monza, uh, Spa. Uh, um, I mean, the two of us together there, it was a, a relationship that was absolutely wonderful that stayed because his wife still calls me maybe three times a year. Uh, you know, it's it's a period in the sport. I think there has been no other. You had that incredible battle with Jochen Rint in the 69 British Grand Prix, and then you came to Monza, and again the World Championship was there to be clinched, and again you found yourself wheel to wheel with Jochen Rint, Jochen in the Lotus 49, you in the in the Matra. Tell us about your thoughts on Jochen and that race at Monza, that slipstreamer, one of the last great slipstreamers at Monza. Of course, we had the Peter Gethin one in 71, but that was a classic as well. You won that race by 0 0.08. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and it happened not by mistake. And Ken was more responsible for it than me because we worked it out that our gear ratio would take me across the line without having to change gear. And if I had changed gear, it was a hesitation. I would have lost it. It wasn't me, it was Ken. that worked, Because we, we talked a lot about where our shifts were and so forth. And he said, uh, can, you go through, can, can you go across the line on, on the shift? And I said, no. He said, well, we've got to put another ratio in. And the ratio got me, I mean, it was a matter of probably, I don't know, three, four, four five feet. Uh, that, that you, were, that you, were, you know, and I won the race because of that. And at that time, the crowds at Monza were even wilder than they are now because they got access. And when Helen and I, you know, you had to go, and, and those days, Helen would come on the podium with me. That was the, the wife would do that, and, and we got the, the crowd were unbelievable and then chased us. Um, and we moved, we, we had to go into the the um, headquarters, you know, below the, the podium was where the, the CEO was of Monza. So we ran in there because they, they were trying to get to me, this the fans were, and they broke in, they broke in 
to, to his office. They broke the door down. And then Helen and I went into the loo, had to go to get away from them. And 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 they broke down the door of the loo. I mean, broke it down. And Helen and I got, <laughs> got through a window and ran down and jumped finally into the back of a Dunlop uh, transporter next to Ken's car. And they followed us up and turned it over. These things don't happen today. Just listening to you tell that story, it's, it's a stark contrast to today's Formula One where there's a lot of national following of a driver. The Dutch obviously follow Max. The Brits kind of follow Lewis and Lando and George. And, uh, and so it goes on. But you, you weren't like that. You were Jackie Stewart well above all those national interests. And you had fans all over the world correct, from Japan to the United States to Australia, as you say, to Italy. Yeah, but that was because we were driving other cars. You know, you didn't make enough money in a Formula One contract. So to make proper money, uh, you would be driving touring cars. You know, Walter Hayes was Ford Motor Company. I mean, he had me a 12-hour race in, in Washington. I would have me down driving a Lotus Cortina. Great car. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Every year I won the world championship. Um, Walter Hayes would have me go around the world to all the Ford outlets. And if and then he, he found out that Goodyear had the same because all around the world they had um, they had rubber plantations. And therefore uh, I, I went around the world with Ford, and then I would go around the world again with 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 Goodyear, because I was a Goodyear at one point. These things don't happen today. I mean, we went to I mean every major city in the world, and when we went there, we'd get introduced to every president. So I had a, a terrific relationship with the, the the president of Argentina, for example, because he was just a hardcore enthusiast, and he also shot. And because of my shooting, it, there was something that happened. So I would go for dinner. I'd be invited for dinner to the king and queen of, of, of Belgium, for example. That, that doesn't happen today. You know? It was a, a relationship that also had a big effect on my commercial relationship, if you like. I, you know, because I probably had more to do with commercials then than any other driver. Um, but it was because there were multinational corporations that I was going to in every corner of the world. I mean, the drivers today have very few at at attendances, by comparison, I mean. So, Jackie, it's interesting. <clears throat> you talk often about Goodyear, and we know how close your relationship was with Goodyear and a great company. But it's interesting to look back now at how big a part Dunlop played in your racing career. And, and I'm wondering about your relationship with Dunlop and how sad you were when they pulled out of Formula One. Absolutely. I mean, I went up to to Birmingham to say, listen, why are you doing this? This is the best advertising facility you have in the world. In Formula One, you're going to every corner. And only then was television beginning to take an interest. But the media were big interest in these days. Um, so, I mean, I went to, to and met the chairman and the CEO of, of uh, and that's the sort of thing that happened. The same thing I, I had with ELF. I always went to the CEO and the chairman. The same thing with all these relationships were very deep. And at Ford Motor Company, it was, Ed, it, it was Henry Ford. You know, if I wanted something, I called Henry Ford. I had access to Henry Ford. And, uh, and one of my best friends to this day is Enzo Ford. I met him at the Nürburgring. Um, he came with Ford Motor Company, with Walter Hayes, and I met Enzo Ford. I think he was 16 at the time. He's a trustee now for Race Against Dementia. We're, we're very good friends and have been ever since. Uh, so there, I think there was... I think it was an unusual time, and, and Graham was an unusual person, colorful, glamorous, great public speaker. Um, the relationship we had together, Jimmy and Graham and Dan Gurney. 
when you think about those wheel to wheel battles with Jock and Rint, is that in your mind, if you look back today, is that the epitome of real motor racing? Is that as good as it gets in terms of wheel to wheel combat? Oh, for sure. Yes, I mean, uh, and we were clear as each other. I mean, we, we respected each other perfectly. There was never a time that Jock and put me in a bad position or I put him in a bad position. It just didn't happen because we were friends. We traveled together. We, I got him his house uh, in Switzerland, which was a few hundred yards from my house in Switzerland until he was building his own house. And his own house was built. I was in it just the other day. Nina was with me last night here because it was, uh, it was uh, our uh, wedding anniversary last night. And Nina was there, of course. Uh, so the relationships we had, Graham, when I was with BRM, I, I was living in Scotland. I would move down and I would stay at the house with Betty and, and Damon and his two sisters. And they would wake me up in the morning and do silly things to me. Uh, and when we would drive up to Snetterton and, and test. Uh, I mean, those relationships that we had, Graham and Jimmy and... Jochen and, and Piers and, and all, all of them, I mean, were real friendships. And, and we lived together, traveled together. We holidayed together. We went to Bermuda with Jimmy, Piers Courage and, and, uh, and, and Helen and I. When you went back to Monza in 73, going back to where we started at that epic race, there were chicanes at Monza. What were your thoughts of the Monza then, 73, compared with the slipstream Monza that you'd known and on which you'd been so successful? How did you, how did you approach that? A chicane, artificial, and a, 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 a chicane in Monza, one of the greatest racetracks in the world. Uh, and, and it happened a lot. It was just wasn't, it just wasn't one, uh, at Monza, there was there was more than one little chicane put in. Uh, it was so false and not real. And yet, the greatest race of track of them all, I closed the Nürburgring. But I still respect it as the finest racetrack that's ever been built. And I, I you know, I'm more than proud of it because I got, you know, I won by over four minutes and the pissing rain, but I won in Formula 2. Actually, I got, you know, that the, there's a ring that you're given a ringmeister. Uh, Helen's got it in her, it's part of her, her stuff. Um, I was given it not in a Formula 1 car, I was given it in a Formula 2 car, driving mm -hmm. a Formula 2 car, an Urban ring, and, and it was the worst racetrack in the world as far <laughs> as safety was concerned. But it still was there, you know. And, and the Formula One one, I remember, because I actually made a mistake on one corner at the Nürburgring, but I had such a margin that it didn't matter and I didn't hit anything. But I, I spun in, in a water, you know, in the real water. And the marshals, uh, luckily I didn't even have to help the help the marshals. I had kept the engine running. Um, but, uh, you know, that was... The most bizarre motor race that's ever taken place in the world. Still feel, you know, more proud than I should about that particular one. When you go to Monza this weekend, what are your thoughts going to be in terms of the present day, and indeed your your history at the circuit? How do you feel about Monza in general? I have a I have a real deep feeling for it. I have a real respect for it. Um, I was seriously thinking of not going to it because of the structure. You know, you know, I had this um, little problem in Jordan when I was down there. You know, I had a stroke, and uh, I've been cutting back on some things. And I seriously, I put my schedule. We weren't going to Monza, and then I thought I can't not go to Monza. <laughs> so I, I'm flying down. Instead of going on Thursday night, I'm flying down on Friday morning um, just to, to give myself a better chance. Um, 
No, Monza for me still would be the race that I have most memories of. And because of the Italians having such passion, it's real knowledgeable passion. I mean, Brazil has enormous passion, uh, but it's new generation passion. Uh, and it's just got it. I mean, I used to stay in the Villa Desti Hotel. It was one of the best hotels in the world at the time. And they would have Paul and Mark there. And, you know, it was, it was an, an incredible period of good things and bad things because so many people were getting lost, you know, in death. Um, but, you know, I am going down to Monza. I, I, after I decided I wouldn't be going, I couldn't face it. So that's <laughs> why I'm going. <laughs> So, so, Jackie, we wish you all the very best with uh, uh, you looking great and healthy and with any recovery that still needs to be put there. But I, my last question to you is your secret to life, your secret to happiness and to keeping it going and for there always being something to look forward to tomorrow. How, what, what drives you? What is your secret? I don't have one. Um, I don't have a secret. Um, I love the sport. I love the past, but I love the present. And I think I'm going to love the future uh, because it's surrounded by terrific people. You know, Bernie was an amazing man, very critical of Bernie. I've been many times, but he was an unusual individual. Today, Domenicali is a very an unusual individual and talented person. The people like Francois Guiter at Elf was a remarkable man. Uh, we had monarchs who came to Grand Prix uh, that just added that something to it that doesn't happen today very often. I think I lived in a time that probably was the finest period of time in, in the history of the sport, while at the same time, being the saddest because we lost more lives during that same period. But for whatever reason, um, you know, I never drew blood from my body driving a racing car. I mean, I had my spa shot, but I never drew blood from my body. And I've had a relationship with all of those people in a period where that doesn't happen anymore to any extent, uh, whether it be my relationships with the Queen or the, or wherever I was. I'm still a close relationship with Albert because of his mummy and daddy, because he was a puppy. <laughs> so my time, I'm lucky, and I never drew blood from my body driving a racing car. I tell everybody I didn't go fast enough. <laughs> so Jackie, thank you so much.